perception. Perception is the gift that enables us to understand and experience what we see. Perception enables us to survive and adapt in this changing world. So perception enables us to be intelligent. It's a hallmark of all intelligent systems. Now let's look at what exactly we mean by this word with a few examples here. So we, when we uh, use our senses, we smell, we touch, we see, we uh, move and we act in various ways. And in doing so, we are able to acquire knowledge about what we see. So for example, we are able to uh, you know, identify colors, textures, shapes of objects, and sizes of objects. And in doing so, we are able to get a sense for how our world works. So the question is, can we make machines do that? And so that's, that's uh, what I've been focusing on in my research. I'm going to share with you some ideas of how we may do that. Let's first talk about what exactly do we do today. So we do what's called a computer controlled methodology where you have a human in the loop that designs what's called algorithms. So algorithms are nothing but a set of steps or instructions that the computer follows blindly and is able to basically take an input and produce an output. So it's called an input-output model. So when we look at it this way, all the work is done by the human in the process of making the system apparently do something very intelligent. So in this particular case, we have a car image that is processed by the computer through the algorithms to produce an output that locates the car and maybe estimates the size of the car, for example. These sophisticated algorithms have enabled us to produce a whole bunch of machines, including the Mars rover that went up recently and gave data about whether we have water on Mars or not. However, the fact remains that it requires a human in the loop in order to be able to do what it does. So is it possible really to come up with machines that can do this on their own is the key question. So let's think about it from the brain point of view. So a common theory that brain scientists think about is, you know, you have, uh, you have your energy, that is light energy and sound energy and so on, that is sensed by, our, you know, by, by us, and then the brain processes this information to produce what are called neural representations or internal representations of what we see. So the idea is that the brain is able to capture all the details once it looks at or listens to something, and then uses that to reason about the world. Now, that's very easily, uh, you know, uh, people have done this a lot and have tried to use this model to see if you can build machines that actually can perceive on their own. But I'm going to give you a simple example to show why that may not be the case. So, everyone is familiar with this particular example. So, we have a couple of pictures. They're static here. And the, uh, the task is to find six differences between the two images. So, what you would do, you would quickly scan the left and the right, and you try to identify mismatches between the two images, and then go, okay, these are the six differences. Now, when we do this, if you think about it, is the brain really taking what you see, capturing it inside, and then using this internal representation to actually find, come up with the answer? And the answer is no. Why? Because if you think, if you think about it, these images are static, so the brain has a chance to capture everything, and then, does it really help you do what you want to do? No, because you're moving your eyes, you're constantly comparing the two images, meaning to say, you're going back into the environment, trying to produce actions to gather information, and then try to process that information to come up with the answer. Which means this internal picture or internal representation is really not the way we do it. Then how do we do it? So that's the question we've been trying to think about. So, uh, there was an insight from evolution that uh, sparked our thinking, and here I'm going to talk to you about one particular uh, idea. So, uh, you know that plants and animals evolved over billions of years, and as we see them today, you know, there are some stark differences still between them and us, plants and animals. So, plants really are not mobile. They are very limited in their mobility, whereas animals are very mobile. And if you notice, plants do not have neural cells, whereas animals do. So, we ask this question, what if the brain is fundamentally involved in trying to basically select and perform actions rather than in the business of taking in information and processing it like we think it, it should be doing like a computer. 
So if it were to do that, can we then uh, sort of look at perception as a subset of that activity, which means the idea is perception is a way of acting. It is not the way the brain takes information and processes it and then tries to do something with it, but it's based completely on what we try to do every day. So let's try to uh, motivate this idea with, some, with an example. Here you see a robotic avatar moving its head, uh, as, and as it's moving, you can see the, uh, the stereo image here of the two eyes that the robot is looking at. And so what we believe the brain is actually doing is it's trying to learn so-called sensory to motor dependencies. So initially, the motor actions are initiated randomly, and the stimuli that results because of those motions is used by the brain to build the sensory to motor dependencies. And later on, it can even sort of use sensory information without any motor actions to produce, uh, or sort of select out possible motor actions it can take. So this is the gist of the idea. I'm not going to scare you with all the math here, but basically what we're going to show you next is some examples of how this could be applied. So let's think of infants and how they learn to perceive a space. So how do they really do that? If you think about it, they're flailing their arms and legs, and as they're doing that, what they're trying to gather is the brain is trying to basically abstract this relationship between sensory to motor dependency. Now, we have captured this idea on the left here with the, with the, uh, the cartoon of an infant robot. And so if you play it again, so it's basically babbling, so to speak, its arms and legs, in this particular case, just the arms and it keeps looking at what it's babbling at. And so from the changes in the sensory stimulation to the motor stimulation, the brain, the brain is able to abstract this dependency. And later on, after it's done this for a while, a miraculous thing happens. The child is able to reach for a toy, and you never program the child to do so. Similarly, we find that the robot is able to reach for a target without any explicit programming. So which means, that the system is able to learn the right sorts of information and being able to produce the right sorts of drops of actions due to this learning process. So I'm going to give you another example. So nobody taught us how to use tools or pointers. Well, maybe if it's a special drill or something, but regularly, if you think about it, I never was taught how to use a pointer. Then we wondered if you can make a machine do that automatically without having to program it. And what we have is right now, if you look at this particular video, we actually stuck a little pointer in the robot. Uh, the robot The robot basically initially learned this uh, sensory to motor dependency, and later on it's able to do that. It's an emergent property or behavior that was not explicitly programmed into the robot. I'll give you another example. Here is a spider robot. It's a six-legged machine. Uh, it's got a stereo camera and a wireless link to a remote computer, and the computer houses the brain model, so to speak, that builds this sensory to motor dependency. So here, the robot is doing what's called babbling. So it's moving around randomly, and as it does that, it's staring at a red disc in the corner here. And that red disc is stimulating the stereo cameras to produce changes in those images that it sees as it moves around. So as it does that, the, the brain model is slowly abstracting out the, the changes in sensory to motor dependencies. And it's using that knowledge, it's able to do several interesting things. First of all, let's see what does it mean to be a red disc. For the robot, if it moves closer to the red disc, it becomes bigger. If it goes far away from it, it's smaller. If you do a flick of the motor or, or, a, or, a, or, or, the, or the eye, then you'll see changes such as a spherical, uh, uh, sorry, a circular disc becomes a, an elliptical disc. Or depending on the, origin, uh, the location of the light, the colors of the pixels may change, and so on. So the robot, as it's doing its babbling, so to speak, is able to abstract all this knowledge and build itself as so-called sensory to motor dependency, and which is then able to use later on. I'm going to get tell you how. For example, let's consider this scenario where the same robot that learns how to uh, perceive a disk is now placed much further away than how uh, before, and what it's supposed to do is play this game Go Seek Rec Disk. So it's far away, and so it takes a quick uh, survey of the scene, and it's sort of tentative because it's not sure if any of the sensory motor dependencies are really met or not. So it makes a couple of movements forward and it sees that the red disc becomes slightly bigger and so it sort of realizes that, ah, this could be potentially the thing I want to go after. And uh, so later on, it becomes more and more confident as it gets closer. In this particular case, the robot is even able to proactively reorient itself towards the disc 
and then make much more confident movements to the desk. So what has happened here is the robot has not only learned about the desk, that has learned to perceive the desk, but is also able to use that to produce emergent behaviors that are not regularly programmed. We don't. We actually do not program into the machine. And that's the interesting part. So where are we going with all this? So uh, at the Center for Neural and Emergent Systems at HRL, I'm leading a program called uh, Synapse, which is a DARPA-funded project. We are trying to build a revolutionary electronic chip that will house millions of neurons and billions of synapses, consume very little amount of power, and have a very small footprint, and be able to endow machines to learn from perceiving their environment, and in doing so, hopefully produce uh, a whole bunch of applications. So what we have in mind is, for example, intelligent assistance that could help the uh, hearing impaired or the visually impaired to be able to see or listen. Uh, and also prosthetic devices that may help people who have lost their limbs to be able to do dexterous manipulation. Uh, we're thinking about cars and vehicles that could basically avoid accidents on their own and also prevent um, so self-diagnose and understand what they're doing basically. And also unmanned uh, vehicles or in fact unmanned uh, air vehicles that could track complex threats in a you know, ever-changing world. So, in conclusion, what I want to say is we are, we are developing a bunch of ideas that will enable the machines to perceive their environment without human intervention and the resultant behaviors will hopefully enrich our way of living. Thanks for your attention.